Welcome to the Looper Podcast, the show where we make the rounds with interesting golf personalities. Here's your host, Eric Payton. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Looper Podcast. Thank you for tuning in to the show today. I'm really excited for today's episode, as always, uh, but this episode kind of came out of a Twitter interaction that I had with Jeff and the Universal Golf Rankings. Um, I'd never really heard of this ranking system before. Um, It's fairly new. Uh, I think Jeff said in the episode that it started um, earlier this year. Um, But I'd heard of the official World Golf Rankings, which a lot of golf fans have. Um, That's the the main ranking system in the world of professional golf. Um, But there's obvious flaws with that system. And so um, he's going to talk about his system and why why they came about creating it and uh, what makes it unique, what makes it better. Um, And this was just a really interesting conversation. So I hope you enjoy this conversation with Jeff Bullock of the Universal Golf Rankings. Jeff Bullock here, co-founder of the Universal Golf Rankings. We call it Tugger. So that's probably what we'll refer to it as. And we launched early there early this year and uh can i can go and kind of give you the backstory with that but i'm excited to be here with you yeah thanks for being here um so the first question i have for you is just kind of what's your um what's your background in golf how'd you get started and what's what's your experience in the yeah game? yeah i think like a lot of people um I, I can i can never remember not playing golf right so grew up with a golf club in my hand played competitively through high school uh you know, not that high school careers are, you know, everyone, everyone has a great high school career, right? But uh, I grew up in Colorado. I won the state junior stroke play my senior year, and that was sort of the pinnacle of my my career. So at one point was a scratch golfer. I'd say if I break 80 these days, it's a good day. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you said you're the the co-founder of the Universal Golf Ran- Rankings or Tugger. Um, who else would be on your team and who's who's behind uh, this ranking system? Yeah, so there's six of us. And really, the quick backstory is we were on a golf trip back in November, and talking about the OWGR and really what was going on in the world of golf at the time, which obviously has changed a lot in the last 48 hours. But uh, we were just talking about golf rankings and how the OWGR at the time talked about how they weren't going to rank live players. And you could just start seeing the disparity in the, you know, what we felt like were actual real rankings and what they were posting. And we kind of threw around the idea, hey, should we start our own ranking system? And, uh, you know, it was one of those few times in life where a dinner conversation turned into action. And uh, so there's six of us and we we kind of span all different, uh, I guess, skill sets. So we've got a web developer, we've got a data, kind of a data scientist who does really all the number crunching. Uh, and then some marketers and business executives. So we uh, we actually complement each other pretty well. There were six of us at the table that day, and the six of us uh, just went all in on it. Excellent. That's cool. So this conversation kind of came from uh, a Twitter reply that that um, we'll get into a little bit more later on. But um, that was the first I'd heard of Tugger. But as I dug into it, and and for those who don't know, you, you mentioned OWGR. That's the official World Golf Rankings. That's kind of right now the you could say the industry standard for ranking of, of golfers. Um, and there's a lot of, you know, um, there's a lot of conversation around that, especially over the last two years. And it, you know, this week, as you've mentioned, has changed the framework of professional golf. Um, and I'm going to try to get this podcast out as soon as possible because, because it is, I think relevant and it's something I haven't heard much talked about since the news on Tuesday where, where live and the PGA tour essentially have merged. Um, but you're right. There was, there was a, a failure of the OWGR kind of because of live, but was that was, was the live golf stuff, the primary, uh, uh, fault or, um, downfall of OWGR in your perspective and the reason for this, or were there other reasons that you felt like a, a new ranking system was needed? I'd say them excluding live was a primary catalyst. I mean, when you just come out and say, hey, we're going to exclude golfers from being ranked because we don't like where they're playing golf, uh, that was a primary catalyst. 
you know, we can unpack it as deep as you'd like to go, but the OWGR formula as they calculate rankings is, you know, in our opinion, it's flawed, it's biased. There's a lot of assumptions that are in there. And just the way they reward points and reward rankings, um, we just feel like it's it's a it's a biased system that doesn't give an accurate reflection of maybe who the best players in the world are. And I think the live them excluding live at the time, you know, about six months ago, sort of tipped the scales and said, hey, you know, it it doesn't look like there's anything out there that's trying to rank all golfers in an unbiased way. You know, can we step in and do it? And so. Um, I'm happy to kind of jump into the the differences if you want me to go there right now. Yeah, yeah that'd be great. Yeah, so OWGR is what we call a points-based system. So they've come up with a formula. It's very complex. They actually, I laugh about it because in their uh, explanatory video on YouTube, about halfway through the narrator says, okay, I may have lost you at this point, but hang with me, Right. And so it's just, it's a very complicated formula. And then what they do is they award points based on where you finish in a tournament. And, but, you know, every tournament has a different point set. It's an exponential curve. So you get, you know, a lot more points for finishing first, second, third, fourth than you do for 20th or 25th. And what we've found is that players can rise really quickly and fall really slowly or they get stuck in what I call OWGR purgatory, where you're just sort of stuck in the system and you can't break out of it. And there's a lot of people that are ranked sort of 150th through 500th that are just in OWGR purgatory and they can't get out. So we've taken a completely different approach, a different blueprint. And a lot of it was driven by the fact that they were excluding live and we're taking a performance-based approach. So it's a relative strokes calculation based on how players play against each other. And so if you think about it this way, we've created a, a inside a massive database of data. We've created connections of every golfer and how they play against every other golfer that they come in contact with throughout the year. And so the average golfer plays about 450 different competitors every year because no two players play the exact same schedule. So you're getting a lot of crossover of different players. And so I like to say, you think about it like a satellite system. And we've used this analogy on Twitter where you only need four satellites to pinpoint your exact position on earth if you have a GPS. Well, we've got essentially 450 satellites with a relative stroke average to you that can pinpoint exactly how you stack up relative to everyone else. And then there's secondary connections and tertiary connections that all get factored into this big matrix and it basically outputs to be this beautiful relative ranking of how players are playing against each other. And so when you say a, a player has, you know, 450 competitors, that that means they played in the same um same event together, correct? Same, same event together, yep. Is is there any um you know, I know there there are I don't even know how you would do this, but between um, players who went off early and late, who who maybe had very different weather conditions, but played in the same event. And, you know, I think we saw this a couple of weeks ago at, it might've been at the masters where it was morning or, or afternoon was very different conditions and very different scoring patterns. Yeah. Is that taken into consideration at all? Is that even possible? It's probably possible. We don't take that into consideration. Um, that would be just a next level of resources that we would need to commit to this, which um, we don't have at this moment, but, um, but you are correct. So you get, you basically, you get, you create a connection. If two players play the same course on the same day in the same event, they get a relative score. So we call it head to head matchups, right? They get a, you know, on a Thursday at a tour event, there's 10,000 head to head matchups going on because Every single person has 155 head-to-head -head matchups, and they the next person's got 154 different head-to-head -head matchups. So you extrapolate that, and you get tens of thousands of head-to-head -head matchups against each other. Right, right. That makes sense. And I, I guess I I didn't expect that to be an impact on the thing. You know, that's something that's happened recently in just amateur golf handicaps is that they've had you know an influence Better. on like how was how was the day playing um which is kind of nice but i'm not sure how that plays out with 
world golf rankings, especially since golf courses are not rated on tour and that sort of stuff. Um, well, and if I can just one last thing, why it works and works really well is because you get crossover of live players in majors. You know, recently it was in DP World Tour events. You get them in Asian Tour events. And the reality is, is the DP World Tour and the Asian Tour are sort of the crossroads of global golf. You know, the PGA Tour is actually more insulated than we than we think it is just because the best players play on that circuit. But those on DP in Asia, they're playing all over the world. And so you get a lot of crossover over tours where you're getting these connections, right, of everyone's head-to-head -head relative matrix in this massive matrix. And that's why we are so confident in the output that comes out and why it works. You know, we get a lot of questions of, well, how do you rank 54 whole tournaments against 72? And that doesn't matter because we just need rounds played, right? We just need head-to-head -head matchups played. The more, the better, but uh, we're stripping out sort of those arbitrary assumptions that other systems have to make. So there's no, um, I guess, for lack of a better word, points given for winning event versus coming in second. That that distinction is not made. It's strictly based on the score that a player shoots compared to someone else in a given round. Correct. Correct. So it's not a points based system. So there's no extra points given. But where we think it um, actually tends to be more accurate is that our system measures magnitude of victory and not just victory. So, you know, I always say Scotty Scheffler won the waste management by, I think, two shots. And whether he won by 10 shots or by two shots, he would have gotten the same number of points that OWGR was going to award. But in our system, if he wins by 10 shots, that's taken into account because he lapped the field, right? Like he should get credit for the fact that he outplayed everyone by a magnitude of more sh or fewer shots than everyone else. And so that gets taken into account. And, um, and that's what we love about the system too, is that every shot counts. Yeah. So it's not that it's weighted differently, that the, the tournament or the win, it's just that every shot he can almost weight it himself by by how many shots he wins by for example for like you were saying 10 to 10 versus 2 that increases his ability to gain ground on other people um in the that's, whole ranking overall that's exactly right so i like to say we don't see tours we just see players and that's why it's great and like sometimes you know up until two days ago i, I had this tweet teed up literally for tuesday and then it got squashed where people were debating about how many spots live golfers should get in majors, just like exemptions, right? And I was going to say, guys, we're missing the point here. It's not about, you know, it's not about how many spots should this tour get or should this tour get. It's just who's the best players in the world, right? We shouldn't be seeing tours. We should be seeing players. And uh, that was magnified when the president of the PGA during the week of the PGA Seth Waugh said that, you know, the purpose of OWGR is to rank tours first and then players. And that sort of blew up on Twitter a little bit because it was like, oh, well, we thought the OWGR was ranking players first, not tours. And uh, now it probably doesn't matter. But, you know, it's, yeah. it's just an interesting thing of, you know, when you dig into the minutia of rankings, there's so many different assumptions that happen on the OWGR side that we don't have to make those assumptions, which just makes it a more pure output. Yeah. And, you know, more morality aside, whether you're pro live or anti live, um, one thing that was be becoming obvious is that the OWGR was, was becoming less and less accurate by the day because they've chosen to exclude live who, yes, they have some of the, some not top players in their league, but they also have some of the top players in the league, whether you like it or not. Um, the other thing that was even pre-live that was becoming, or was at least a discussion with OWGR was the, uh, the, the time frame that they used. The, the cycle is, I believe, two years, um, which, you know, so if a player has a really hot, you know, six months, but that was two years ago, and ever since then they haven't made a cut, they're still ranked fairly highly. Um, now, can you tell me about your your cycle and how you came upon that number, that size versus the two years of OWGR? Yep. 
So we've gone through a little evolution and we might come full circle um, depending on how sort of the research goes. But we started at 18 months, look back, equal weighted. And this has been sort of the hot topic um, amongst our kind of sort of Twitter community is that we have equal weighted every tournament going the past 18 months. And the reason why we did that is because we're a strokes based system, not a points based system. So we wanted to keep the strokes pure. We didn't want to get fractional strokes in there. Um, what we found though, is that 12 months was a better reflection of who was playing the best. Now going back 18 months, it was just it was taken in too old of data. So before the masters, we pivoted to do just a 12 month look back. And that gave us much, much better accuracy. Um, and we can talk about accuracy later, but gave us much better accuracy toward, you know, against OWGR and a much better reflection of, you know, who is playing well now. Um, so that's, I guess that that's your question. The, the second, the, the, the next part of that is, Brooks winning the PGA highlighted, uh, I guess I'll say a lag in our system in a very unique situation. And that is Brooks went from basically operating table to major champion in such a short amount of time that our 12 month look back that's an equal weighted system is taking in really poor rounds that he played just six to nine months ago, right? And um, and so when he won the PGA, I think he jumped up to 33 or 31 in our rankings. And, you know, it was how was he only this? He got second in the Masters. And and it, it was I think it was a really good realization that maybe we do need to do some sort of weighting of current events first and be weighted. So we're going through that research right now and back testing. We want to keep the strokes pure. What we have found, which I'll just conclude with, is that the head-to-head -head approach is a much more pure uh, way of doing it. So whether we do a head-to-head -head, um, a head-to-head -head approach with with a sliding weight going down or an equal weight, that's the foundation, and the foundation is strong. So um, you could see stuff in the next few weeks or month of us looking at doing a weighting scale, and I think that would bring these unique situations like Brooks better, better into a reflection of where they should be. Yeah. And like I said earlier, that's kind of where this conversation came from was where I had, I had seen shortly after the PGA win, um, something about, uh, Tugger and, uh, and that Brooks was at the time ranked, I think right around 30, 35. Um, and I said something about, you know, may want to relook the formula mm -hmm. and, and, uh, you know, Brooks is is a, a unique player, I think, even in the history of our game. Um, and that's something I also want to ask you about with the weighting system as well. But basically, Brooks, even before Liv, he was a guy who performed really well in majors and pretty poorly other times. He obviously um, thrived on the pressure. You know, there's if you think back to, I mean, anyone who can who's listening, who plays golf, has those rounds where they feel a little bit more pressure to play well in, in high school and in professional, when I played a little bit professionally, I tend to, I tended personally to play better under the pressure and worse when there wasn't pressure. Now other people do the opposite. Um, and so my, I guess my question for you is Brooks being, I kind of consider him the, the active player with the most majors outside of Phil and tiger, which, you know, tiger, you can debate whether he's active or not. And, right. and, he's got five majors as a 33 year old. Is there any consideration to just say like, yes, two years may not be the greatest metric, but also looking at a player's career and saying he's, he's on his way to being one of the game's greatest. And he's just potentially entering his prime because, you know, at this stage, I don't think Phil had won a major yet. Mm -hmm. Um, or maybe he had just won his first, um, and so he's, he's, he's a unique example of is waiting like the OG, OWGR does a valuable thing to have included in a, in a ranking system. Yeah. I mean, that's, I, I think we're kind of tackling that now. Um, so you, you said something interesting with, I mean, the reality is in the last 12 months, Brooks is playing like the 30th best player in the world because his six through 12 months 
wasn't great at all. I mean, he's missing cuts when he played on the Asian tour and not finishing well. He's the hottest player on the planet for the last three months. We ran our system just with a three month look back and he was number one, right? And you're like, of course, like that that's where he's at. Um, but you mentioned before, you know, even when he was on the PGA tour, he just cared about majors and just showed up. And I, I sent a tweet out maybe a week ago that I, I talked about major, major, I said, there are major players and then there are major players. And, you know, what is your top 10 finish percentage in majors? And Jack in his prime, I think was 62%, you know, 62% of the time he finished top 10. Uh, Tiger in his prime was 59. Scotty Scheffler right now is like 53% and Brooks is 50, right? And Rory's 49. So, you know, these are the players that every other major they're in the top 10 of the major and brooks is one of the best who has a top 10 finish percentage and quite frankly that's i think he said that that's all he really cares about right um and so you sort of throw out rankings a little bit when the majors come along right um to to figure that out going back to the actual ranking side though and maybe this is where we talk about accuracy is so we measure our accuracy against OWGR using about five different metrics. It's I kind of I kind of think about it as like valuing a valuing a stock if you know how to value a stock. There's lots of different ways that you can try and figure out what the fair value of a company is, right? No one perfect way. It's the same idea when trying to figure out accuracy of ranking systems. There's no one perfect way to say, well, whose system is more accurate than the other. Um, we've come up with five different metrics and we measure them every single week. You know, how, have, how do we do against OWGR? And we consistently, I mean, every single week we've beat them in all five metrics uh, since we started tracking going about 10 tournaments ago. So almost three months now we do it. So we know that we are a more accurate system or a, a better reflection of who the best players are, um, and which just means the fundamental of a head-to-head -head ranking system as opposed to a points-based system just seems to be a more fundamentally sound system. And then it's just figuring out, do we weight it or not weight it? Because the foundation is solid. Yeah. And I don't want to just focus on the 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 one that, that I noticed is yeah. kind of an anomaly there. I, I will say, as I'm going through the rankings, there's guys like Ricky Fowler specifically, who seem much more accurate in years and years. I believe it's 23 he's he's ranked 23 and i think owgr he's more like 43 or something yeah. um and he's playing really well in the last year but he's also brought down by his play you know two years ago yeah. um okay so what's kind of the the process to updating the formula like is there is there a regular um interval you you do that at and and how often does that happen? And, you know, what's, what's involved with that? So ideally we settle on it and then we never update it. Right. I mean, I think that we, we don't, you know, one thing I've hit OWGR with is they have changed some aspect of their formula or their, who they include or who they exclude um, 50 times in the last 30 years. Right. So they're, they're changing something almost every six months. And we don't want to be that. We want to have this consistent look back of, hey, here's the formula. It's performance based and we're going. So we really have two assumptions. And the two assumptions is that we look back 12 months and you have to have 20 minimum rounds to be incorporated in the system. So someone like Michael Block, I think he's ranked 500th in the OWGR because he had a great PGA. Uh, he's not ranked in our system, not because we don't want to, but he just doesn't meet the minimum round threshold right now. Um, so those are really the two assumptions. And then everything else is just head to head um, look back. So ideally, if we go to a weighting of some sort or a D weighting over time, ideally, that's the last update. But I guess the beauty of I feel like Twitter, which we have embraced, and I feel like, you know, there's a kind of a community that's actively rooting for us and actively helping us is they they give us suggestions and we're, we're open ears to it. Like we know that we are 98% where we want to be, but we're also four months into this and we know that maybe a tweak here and a tweak there could help. But ideally, if we get it right, we don't make tweaks because it's just performance-based. And we can always point back to that. We sit, you know, sometimes people engage with us and they're like, your rankings are stupid, your rankings are wrong. And 
we're just like, look, it's just math, right? Like we're not making assumptions. We don't get the output and say, oh, you know, we should really adjust Brooks up because it'll look better. Like the math just works itself out and then we, we publish it. Yeah. So would you say you're kind of in a beta stage right now? And, and then there's like, are you, are, do you envision this being kind of tweaking over the first 12, 24 months? And then by that time you've got kind of got it figured out and that's when you set it and I and mean, I, I, I would say we're beyond beta stage. I would say we were, I mean, I think we felt like we had made the one tweak we wanted going from 18 months to 12 months. And then the Brooks, what I'm calling the Brooks doctrine popped up and it was like, oh, maybe we should look into waiting. And then what we, 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 without getting too geeky, we were able to prove the math out to where the fractional strokes wouldn't be an issue to still keep a pure output on the stroke side. So since we were able to prove the math, we started looking into waiting. But ideally, if we make a change, like we're, we're our, you know, like this is it. Yeah. Because so, the reality is the, on the accuracy side, like we are there, like we just week after week, it's just, we're more accurate, we're more accurate, we're more accurate. And yeah. so we know we're there. And it's just those maybe extreme outliers that make it seem like that's, I mean, that's initially what caught my eye was the outlier. Um, so let me ask you this. If we've talked about Brooks and Fowler, are there any others on there um, that you've noticed on your ranking that you feel like are much different than OWGR in a positive way? So where we see the biggest disparity which i'm not sure who will be able to like pick out the 500th best golfer in the world but the biggest disparity is those ranked 150 through 500 and and that's where again i feel like they fall on owgr purgatory or they're playing on dp world tour asian tour japanese tour and they're just not getting the looks that they want or they're corn fairy tour players who are great players on the corn fairy tour but the weight, the points that they're being allocated just doesn't accurately reflect their skill level. And they just haven't gotten their chance yet to give up. So we ran our accuracy metrics on the last DP World Tour event this last week. And it was multiples more accurate than what we get on PGA Tour events. And PGA Tour events is multiples more accurate than OWGR. And that's because that field was made up of more of the journeymen of golf in, you know, the 200 to 500 ranks. And, um, and so that's where, you know, without picking out a, a, a particular person, that's the biggest difference where I feel like we can represent, because as I always say, the, anyone should be able to come up with a decent ranking system to get the top 25 ballpark correct right? Like we could just eyeball the top 25 and probably be correct, right? But it, I think the true reflection of a ranking system is how are you ranking those 100 through 1000? Because does that make sense? Because everyone should get a fair shake. And we get a lot of feedback on the Champions Tour. I mean, we rank Champions Tour players integrated in with it. And, you know, Padre Carrington, I think is, I haven't checked lately, but it's probably in the 150, you know, 150 in our rankings. I mean, he's playing all over the world and multiple tours. He got fourth place in Dubai. And uh, that guy deserves to be fairly ranked, even though he still plays the majority of his tournaments on the Champions Tour. Yeah. And I'm just looking at it now. Steve Stricker's 54th, which is interesting to me. Yeah. Um, he's I mean, above Adam Hadwin and Gary Woodland. And so. Yeah. I mean, it's all based I'm, on the math. I mean, Stricker wins 25% yeah. of the time on the Champions Tour. And if you think of it from the Stricker standpoint, he could play in PGA Tour events if he wanted. I'm sure he could get sponsor exemptions. But economically, it's better for him to finish top five in a Champions Tour event than it is 30th or 40th in a PGA Tour event. So he might as well just economically make the right choice. Right. Yeah. Um, so when it comes to, you, you keep talking about like the strokes. So if someone were to go to TUGR.org and they're going to look at the rankings and say right now, John Rahm is the number one player in the world on your rankings and his is zero, relative strokes is 0, 0.0. Yep. Are, are, am I thinking about this correctly? Is it like, if, if there's a par par would be the best player in the world, not, not that he's shooting 72 in a round, but whatever par is. And then Scotty Scheffler is averaging 0. 0.08 strokes per round over, over per round over par. And that par right now would be John Rob. 
Yep, that's a great way to think about it. So the number one player in the world is the benchmark, whoever that is. So Scotty's been at zero, John's been at zero, and everyone is ranked relative to him mm -hmm. on a per on a strokes per round basis. So easiest way to think about it, I'll just go to Max Homa, who's number eight on our list at 0.95. We'll just round up to one to make it easy. So every time Rom and Homa play against each other in the same tournament, Rom generally beats Homa by one shot per round or four shots per tournament. Okay. Um, so what you see where it gets interesting, if you love data and you kind of geek out on it, is the difference between the best player in the world and the hundredth best player in the world is 2.4 shots per round or 10 shots a tournament, right? But the difference between the 100th best player in the world and the 200th best player in the world is only a half a shot per round. So now all of a sudden you're talking about two shot or yeah, two shots per four day tournament that separates the 200th and 400 or 100th. And then if you go down to the 300th best player in the world, again, digging really deep into it, there's only like a shot and a half per tournament that separates them. So what you see is the top 50 players in the world are in a league of their own. They just are. And then 100 through 400, it is razor thin. I mean, you play professionally, you get it. It's a shot here, a shot there that legitimately can be the difference between, you know, a few hundred places in ranking. It, it gets mm -hmm. bunched really quickly. Yep. Yeah. Now it, I just happen to scroll all the way down and it go it, a thousand is the, the lowest person is yeah. what's the kind of the, I guess the thinking behind that is there a reason it's thousand. I don't even know what OWGR goes to. They go to about 4,000. Um, we just haven't released um, the list beyond that. We have it. We, it, cause right now we do the top, I think seven tours and we have the data. We're just making sure that it's accurate. So when we release yeah. it, it'll probably be well over 2000. Okay. Now I'm looking at, oops, go sorry, ahead. go ahead. No, no, go ahead. I was just looking at, uh, so Xander and Rory are three and four. Their yep. relative strokes are the same. I would assume that's just, you know, it, they're both 0.34. I would assume that's, you know, fractional points that almost just don't even show up that Xander's yeah. got such a razor thin, yeah. like you said. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so our latest upgrade, if you really like it, is you can out, you can output this to an Excel spreadsheet by clicking on the three dots at the top. And then you can you can get it. So we just released that about two weeks ago. Okay, that's cool. Yeah. So, um, and, then, and then if you click into them, so click anyone you want. I, I feel like this is sort of our proof in the pudding. And it's easier to see if you go down to someone who's like 50th, right? So click right. on Gary Woodland at 58. If you click on his name, we, we have some advanced stats in there. And we show that Gary Woodland's played 77 rounds in the last 12 months. And he's played 445 different competitors. Great. That's a lot of data points, right? Of those, he's beaten 71% of them. Okay, that's a pretty good win rate. If you scroll down a little bit, my favorite chart is what I call the scatter plot, right? And the scatter plot, this is like the satellite system I'm talking about. It plots his relative position against everyone else's relative position from a stroke standpoint. So you so this is sort of the proof in the pudding of why the system's so accurate, because we can just mathematically show where he plays against on a relative strokes compared to everyone else. And everyone's scatter plot looks very different because it's how they play against everyone else, but that's how you pinpoint a ranking. Hmm. That's really interesting. And you don't uh, the the data that I have seen on OWGR is not doesn't appear to be this this in depth. So this is, this is really cool to see. So we use, I mean, without getting too deep into the tech, we use what's called a cloud optimizer, which is way more powerful than Excel spreadsheets. And most ranking systems that are out there, if you read sort of their fine print disclosures, they talk about using regression analysis, which is a, which is a good form of trying to find correlations. But I mean, regression analysis was developed 200 years ago and a cloud-based optimizer is very recent. So we're just using more powerful technology to be able to output what we're doing. And then it allows us to extrapolate all this cool data. Yeah. Okay. So my next question might be, is what's the, what's the end goal for, for the universal golf rankings? Cause if, if those who are listening don't know, the official world golf rankings are used by a lot of events 
as like an order of merit, like who gets in. If, for example, I think the Masters has like top 50. If you're in the top 50 of the OWGR, you get an invite if you haven't already earned it some other way. Um, and so it's kind of the industry standard, as I mentioned earlier. What is, what's the end goal for Tugger? Is that something you're looking for? And how, how do you accomplish your ultimate goal? Is it just to have a, an alternative ranking system or is it to be the industry standard? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and, and maybe goals have shifted in the last 48 hours as well, yeah. but um, no, the goal, the goal is to become the industry standard. And I know that sounds funny, but we know we have a more accurate system. And so our pitch to majors and our pitch to the industry, which we've been fortunate enough to have some pretty in-depth conversations with high level individuals in the industry, is that if you want the best fields in golf, Hugger has a better representation of the best players than OWGR or other ranking systems. So to be the industry standard is the ultimate goal. With the new shifting landscape, I mean, everything, I feel like opportunities have just, you know, gone crazy in the last 48 hours. If they introduce team golf into the mainstream of, of tour events, I mean, we've been tracking the live team rankings compared to Tugger rankings. And there's an extremely high correlation between Tugger rankings and how the teams play. So we know that our system accurately ranks teams as well which could be amazing if the team concept actually spread, you know, kind of like a Euro league soccer um, style, which some people have talked about. Um, so there's a lot of opportunity there. And then on the amateur and college side, I think that's where the biggest opportunity is. I mean, the, the, the world golf rankings for amateurs and college players suffers from the same flaws and biases that OWGR does. It's a points-based system. It doesn't accurately reflect. And if we overlaid our approach to the college uh, rankings, um, and we've already had discussions with college coaches, you know, the the ability to recruit better, the ability to actually pinpoint who is a better player than somebody else on a relative basis um, could be really big. So we've got a lot of avenues uh, that we're going down. On the pro side, though, yeah, I mean, we're, we're shooting for the top. And that's why we post every single week. We just post our results against OWGR and let everyone, let everyone see it. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, so you're actually going to the, the events, the tours and, and showing them your rankings, or are you just trying to get their attention through social media, at least for now? Uh, probably in between those, right? Yeah. So we're getting, we're getting, uh, and I apologize for the phone ringing. Um, oh, you're fine. Um, we are, we, we've had great discussions. We haven't gone to events yet, but we've had great discussions and introductions to, you know, pretty high level players in the industry that we have ongoing conversations with. Um, and we're hoping, you know, we're hoping to, you know, either create partnerships or lock a few things down, um, you know, in the short order. Yeah. Well, this is cool. I, I, I'm, Excited to see, to dig more into this and to track it a little bit closer. Um, is there anything specific that you feel like we haven't hit that you'd like to let people know about the ranking system um, that they need to know? You know, you've asked a lot of really good questions. I feel like I've hit uh, a lot of a lot of the points that I normally do. I mean, I think, yeah, just the big picture is the methodologies are different. And I think this is where sometimes we have to help people understand over and over and over because we'll get people who say, well, why didn't you wait this live event more or give more points to the live winner? And that's where we always have to go back and say, we're not a points-based system. This is a strokes-based system based on how you play relative to other people. And I think that's just really important for everyone to ingrain because then the rankings make sense, right? You know, OWGR's formula has so many steps and so many assumptions in there. They start at the player level, that they go to the tournament level and they create a tournament weighting. And then they go to a field size level and they create a field size weighting and they go back to the player level. And it's just kind of like energy. You lose a little bit of the energy integrity every time you make another assumption. And by us keeping it all at the player level, right? You inherently have a tournament and field size assumption built in because it's head to head 
against people who are playing in the same tournament against the same field size and they all play against each other so that's why the the integrity of the data is so much more pure and that's what we just hit on as much as we can that it's a performance-based system which is what golf should be all about right um and uh yeah i guess that's all i'd say yeah that's cool oh uh, well i i appreciate you taking the time today but also putting this together because you know there's been so many things in golf over the last two years that have been very political very biased and and you know i'm i'm not all that interested in all the drama that goes along with golf i just want to see good golf and see who's the best and kind of that's that's the point of professional golf and so i like that that it appears there's trying to remove as much bias from it as possible letting the math speak for itself and not not putting any more um unnecessary junk in there so the simplicity of it both the simplicity and the complexity of it is yeah. is impressive as well no i mean you said it exactly and even if owgr starts ranking live tournaments which we don't know if live will still be around or live as we know it but even if they did there's still going to be arbitrary assumptions on 54 holes versus 72 holes versus how do I weight this field versus that field? And again, like there's still going to be the subjectivity that you're not going to please or no one's going to think it's accurate. And so that's why even post, I call it like the new world old order golf company, whatever is going to be the new PGA tour company, even as that gets established, our system is very relevant. And, um, and that's why, you know, some people have said, Hey, you guys are dead in the water because they're combining. And like, my response is I'm actually very excited. I think the opportunities that have been opened up are even more than where we were 48 hours ago. And we're excited to see where it goes. And now why would people say that you're dead in the water because of Tuesday's news? Because now they're going to say, well, Liv's going to be, Liv is now going to get ranking points and, you know, where somehow all the world tours are going to come together in some way, shape or form, and they won't be excluded. Yeah. And, um, I don't know. I mean, first of all, it's going to take time to work that self out, but we've still proven we're more accurate. And right. so like, there's still a place for us, not just a place, but we still think that there's a big place for us that is yet to be, you know, finalized. Right. There's the the live aspect of it, but there's also the accuracy. The accuracy aspect of it is, is and again, the still, accuracy yeah. on a, on it, those who are ranked a hundred plus, that's where you see like the major accuracy really taking root. Um, and obviously there's accuracy below that, but that's where you see the big disparities. Yeah. Cool. Um, so how could people find you and kind of follow the rankings and that sort of stuff? Do you want to plug your, your socials and that sort of stuff? Yep. So we are at tugger.org. That's T-U-G-R dot org. Uh, that's our website. The rankings get updated on a weekly basis, generally Sunday night or Monday morning after all the tournaments have finished. Uh, and then our primary social media is Twitter and our handle is Tugger Golf. So T-U-G-R-G-O-L-F. And uh, yeah, you know, hit, hit our, you know, follow us and uh, you know, we're pretty active on social media. We try to respond to comments and clarify things. You know, we want to engage and I, we have gotten better because of the engagement of the, you know, Twitter community. And so I hope we've showed that we are open to feedback and, you know, things that we're doing. Excellent. Well, again, thank you for, for your time today, Jeff. This has really been, uh, really been interesting. So Thanks. thank you. Thanks for joining us today. Don't forget to subscribe and rate the looper wherever you get your podcasts. You can also follow the show on Twitter and Instagram at looper podcast. Talk to you next time.